Well, hi, Sack School Mate fans. Steve Goodson, once again, I'm speaking to you from the command and control bunker here at our ultra top secret Sack School Mate World Headquarters, located in the Garden District of Old New Orleans. Now, tonight, we're going to talk to you about something that every one of you needs to know something about, and that is repairs that you can do yourself. Uh, probably cause you got to if you're going to finish the gig or something. Uh, you know, are you out on the road or something and your horn's not playing its best? Now, I'll be the first one to tell you that uh, when I was playing all the time, I was the most neurotic guy you ever going to meet. When I would go out on the road, I would take two of everything, two berries, two tenors, two sopranos, whatever. Uh, I think at one time I was even doubling up on the hand percussion, you know, and taking uh, two cowbells and two afushis and, you know, all that good stuff. Um, two weiros. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to talk to you tonight about some stuff that you can deal with yourself. Now, I want to caution you. If you don't know how to fix it, don't you work on it. Did you hear me? Uh, we used to laugh around our repair shop and that, you know, if you worked on it yourself, we're going to charge you double. Uh, and that's, that's just a fact of the matter. If you don't know what you're doing and don't have the right tools and equipment, then you got no business uh, doing, doing it, okay? That, that's real important to keep in mind. Um, and gosh, we've already got a good crowd uh, tonight. And, and you folks feel free to share this uh, with your timelines or with any groups you're a member of. Or, um, you know, I appreciate those likes. Uh, yeah, Ch Chad Taylor says he charges double. Yeah. I know he does, because I've known Chad Taylor's my good friend. He's a master repairman. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've, I've drunk plenty of good liquor with Chad Taylor. And, uh, you know, they got good liquor. It's expensive. So, yeah, you're going to charge a double. But, yeah, pay attention. All right. Now, one of the most common things that people would bring into our repair shop would be uh, Steve, I need you to replace my neck core because, uh, you know, I got this piece of paper wrapped around here and it looks terrible and smells worse and all that. Hold it. Um, let me show you what to do about that. Now, I just happen to have a neck right here. We're going to have some props tonight. Uh, this is a Saks Gourmet neck. And... Uh, Anyway, if you look here at the cork part of it, you want to inspect that very carefully and make sure that in no way is that torn, uh, coming loose, anything like that. All right. All it is is compressed. And cork over time will just compress down, compress down, and compress down. And before long, your mouthpiece doesn't fit very well. This is the most common problem in the world. Now, if you're out there on the gig or something, something I used to always keep in my case uh, for a variety of, of uses was a roll of that a white Teflon plumber's tape. Believe me, boys and girls, that is a lot better than a piece of paper. Uh, you can wrap it very tightly around here, and uh, you won't even need any coarse, uh, cork grease because it's... Uh, you know, it's Teflon, Teflon slides. So uh, anyway, here's what you do to fix it. Take the neck, after inspecting the cork to make sure it hadn't come loose, it not torn, doesn't have any holes in it, and put it in a glass of water. Just the cork part, of course. The water is not gonna hurt the rest of the neck, okay? Uh, but just put the cork in there and let it soak overnight so it's good and saturated with uh, water then take it out and uh, take a good quality uh, blow dryer I use a Conair and uh, 
gently, gently warm up that cork. Now, I'm cautioning you about something. Don't you dare get it too hot because regardless of the type of adhesive that was used on the neck cork, be it shellac, which is the old school way to do it, or, uh, you know, we use uh, uh, Loctite control gel uh, uh, CA glue, and, and we just love that stuff. Uh, but it, it does a great job on this. But heat will loosen any of it. It sure will. And then you'll be <laughs> even worse off, and you'll be having to try to get this thing back on there without tearing it all up. Hey, Richard, glad you could be with us tonight. How's things in Detroit? You taking care of my good friend, Johnny Evans? Johnny Evans is a master player and a great guy. He's one of my favorites. You know that. But uh, anyway, um, then the cork, which is saturated with the water, will, will just gently, gently expand. <clears throat> and then you'll see that before too long, you're gonna to need to keep rotating this, you know, so so you distribute the heat somewhat e evenly. But uh, the cork will somewhat expand and then it'll fit your mouthpiece good again. And uh, then nothing to it. Somebody in the band's got a good quality uh, blow dryer and I had never been in a motel room, didn't have some kind of glasses so uh, that you could put water in and soak your, your neck cork overnight. And really, cork is, is amazingly durable stuff. And uh, you'll find that if you'll do that a time or two, you'll be right back in business and it'll save you a trip uh, down to the repair shop. Um, and uh, there's really nothing, nothing to it. Now, along the same lines, uh, I am forever, you, you know, we, we make more different saxophone mouthpieces than anybody in in the world yeah richard i saw him <laughs> i saw johnny on there johnny tipped me off that he, he was going to be there uh playing at aretha's funeral <laughs> i had never seen johnny evans uh in tuxedo before and now for y'all don't know johnny uh, johnny is uh johnny's kid rocks saxophone player yes i do want to tag jody espina you better believe i'm honored he's with but anyway, seeing uh, Johnny Evans in uh, uh, tuxedo, now boy, that was that was a sight. Joe Volano, good customer of mine too. So uh, anyway, I am a you guys. So let's talk about another problem that's really rather similar. Uh, we make more mouthpieces than anybody else in the world, more different ones. Um, we, we got. I, I'm, I'm guilty of my old friend Sandy Runyon's. <laughs> Sandy used to make more mouthpieces than anybody in the world, and I guess some of that rubbed off on me. That's probably not a good idea. You ought to concentrate on a few. But I, I think we make maybe a dozen different tenor mouthpieces, something like that. Use good sense, like our good friend Jody Espina. Uh, you know, but anyway, here's what you do. You may find that you have a couple of mouthpieces, and one fits your neck cork real well, and one doesn't fit it well at all. So here's what you got to do. Jane Lindsay, honor that you're with us, my dear. Um, here's what you got to do. Size your cork for the mouthpiece that is the smallest in diameter here, see? And, and it, this area right here. Which means one of them will fit on there nice and tight like it should but the other one's going to be too big. Now, what can you do about that? Now, now look here. Pay attention. This is the shank of your mouthpiece right here. This part goes over the cork. And uh, you can just paint the interior of that with a, we use uh, here, I say we, we don't do this for customers. I guess I would if somebody asked me. But I've done it on my own mouthpieces many times. We, yes, I'm glad to have Pete Fluck here, Saxman Pete. Um, 
but I, I would paint the interior of it with J.B. Weld. And uh, after the interior, uh, just a thin coat, after the uh, interior had dried, well, the, the J.B. Weld, then I would take some uh, very fine grade sandpaper and I would smooth it out so it's smooth and even and check and see how we're doing, you know, are we signing strike for that neck cork that we've got? Well, if not, we can always put another layer on there. Or we can take a little more off with the sandpaper. It's really a no-brainer. But, uh, you know, I've had guys make all kind of outrageous proposals. They even had a guy one time said he wanted to buy two necks exactly alike. Um, and I, we sell a lot of necks, but there was no need to sell them one for an extra one for that purpose. When all you got to do is paint the interior of just the shank. Now, don't get the JB Weld nail polish, whatever you use in the uh, inside the uh, the chamber of the mouthpiece. Just just the shank. That's all you got to do. And uh, you know, it, it'll it'll you can make it fit anything you need to do. So uh, that's that's the way you do that. Now. Another thing while we're on the subject of mouthpieces, and before we go this, I want to remind you, everybody that wants to give this uh, presentation a like, feel free to do so. And everybody wants to share it with their friends and neighbors or a Facebook group you're a member of or on your own timeline, you feel free to share it as well. But here's another thing, um, is that if you'll take your mouthpiece and, you know, you out there on the road, you've been playing a long time, and you take the ligature and the reed off, and you look down in there, and, man, there's all that nasty stuff living in there. Well, one thing you ought to do for hygienic reasons and nothing else, you ought to take a soft bristle toothbrush, maybe a little toothpaste, not Captain Don white cotton. Now, I know Captain Don's going to give us a like. I know he will because Captain Don's my buddy. Uh, but anyway. Take a, a soft bristle toothbrush, clean it out real good inside. Remember, you can go in from both ends. But here's the thing. Look here at this part of your mouthpiece. This is, this is the table. And if you just feel it with your fingers with a very light pressure, what you're going to probably feel is, if you've been out on the road for any time, is it's got stuff that's, just built up there. I ain't going to tell you what all that stuff is. Little pieces of reed. How about that? Maybe some other stuff. Maybe uh, one of those burritos you ate during sound check. I don't know. But anyway, here's what you do. Get yourself a um, sheet of glass that is dead flat. Dead flat. Put a piece of a very fine emery paper on it. Uh, for this, we use either 1,500 or 2,500 grit paper. And then with a very, very light pressure, rub the table of the mouthpiece over that because what we want to do is we want to get all that junk off of the table and we want to get uh, this, this table back flat again. Why do we want to get it flat? Because if it's got lumps and bumps in it, it's going to keep your reed from sealing perfectly. And you'll be amazed how much just a simple flattening of the mouthpiece table, that'll make all the difference in the world in the way your mouthpiece plays. Now listen here. Remember I said do this with a very, very light pressure. Uh, in this case, on this, uh, this is a sax forme. Black Beauty mouthpiece, um, and we don't want to take any of that fine, high-quality uh, hard rubber off. We just want to clean off that Rich Davidson. Now, Rich Davidson is a wonderful saxophone player up in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, I've known him for many years. He's a fine guy, and he can play his butt off, but he's a good guy. He's a real good guy. But anyway, just clean it off, clean it off. Make sure this table here is flat. It doesn't have any bumps or lumps, anything like that. Uh, 
so keep it clean. And, and then after you do that, you might take a little of that toothpaste and make sure that's clean too. But be ultra careful not to remove any hard rubber. And don't you dare get up here on the, on the side rails or the tip rail. Don't you do it. Just clean it off. That's why we're using that ultra, ultra fine paper. All right. Now, another thing. Rich, give us a like to this seminar. I know you're enjoying it uh, up there. So, anyway, here's something else. Next time you are down at the place of business of your very favorite uh, repair technician, ask them for, take a little Ziploc baggie with you and ask them for just some scraps of different thicknesses of a cork and felt. So here's some here on my sort of workbench here. Uh, you know, we've cut out little pieces to do different things with and all that and end up with all these odd shaped cats and dogs here. And then we're going to get some, uh, some key, uh, key felts, you know, some of those little round felts and uh, pay them for those, but get you some of every size that's in use on your own. And some uh, pieces of technicians buy felt when they're buying it in, uh, in sheets like this, um, this is, is some super high quality felt. Uh, this is actually the same stuff they cover uh, good uh, pool tables with. Uh, but anyway, just ask them to cut you off a little piece of that. Se that comes in several different thicknesses. And uh, stick those, keep that in your case at all times, along with a bottle of that Loctite uh, Control Gel. Uh, CA glue. You can get that at any hardware store. And look carefully. Maybe get your technician to get, hey, Theron, uh, get your technician and give you a little guided tour of the mechanism on your horn and show you where all these um, silencing corks and corks and felts on the uh, compound mechanisms are. So when you there at sound check and suddenly it's something about your horn not feeling exactly right. And you can uh, chase it down and see what's going on. And maybe just by replacing a little piece of a cork of felt, you can get yourself back in business and not be uh, having problems on the gig. Now listen, uh, it's not going to do you a bit of good in the world to have some scraps of cork and felt and other things in the case unless you've got something to cut it. And uh, I always keep in my case uh, about a half dozen uh, single-edge razor blades. And uh, you can use them for a lot of things. Uh, you can use them for trimming cork and felt uh, in, into the shape that you need. You can use them for uh, adjusting um, your reeds, of course. Uh, and we're going to have a seminar on that coming up in a few weeks. We're going to talk about all the tricks about adjusting those reeds. And then, you know, if you need to prepare some decongestant or something, you can use those single edge razor blades for that. So anyway, um, be sure and do that uh, and replace those felts right away. Um, the nice thing about the control gel uh, glue is that a tank. Hey, as, as a former student of mine, he's a great guy, too. Uh, Tank Hankel. Uh, man, he, he's a good guy. Uh, but anyway, remember, that glue sets up in about 60 seconds. So you got, you got time to adjust it a little bit if you need to. <clears throat> and once you get it adjusted, now here's what you do. You take you some, uh, some emery paper fine grade, and, and, and you put the abrasive, see, here, here we go. There's always some emery paper around here. Look here at this piece of emery paper. We're going to just tear a strip that's about as long as my, um, long as my index finger. We're going to put the abrasive side toward the cork of felt, the smooth side, the yellow side toward the body, close the key foot down or 
whatever, and draw this out, you see, and it'll lap it into the exact shape of the body or, you know, the mechanism, whatever, and you'll have a perfect fit. So anyway, next time you're at the repair shop, just ask them for some, some scraps. You won't need much, but boy, it will get you out of a jam uh, when you in one. All right, now, let's talk about another one of those disasters that happens, uh, and that is you uh, you show up at sound check, you get your horn out the case, and you're up there setting your levels and all that, and then all of a sudden you realize something ain't right with the world, and you look down on the floor, and there is a pad that has fallen out of your horn. What will you do? Now, let me tell you something. It's going to happen. If you uh, carry your horn in the trunk of somebody's automobile, underneath a, a bus, uh, in a trailer, uh, whatever, it's going to be uh, exposed to, uh, you know, temperature and uh, variations. You know, it might be uh, real hot outside. Well, that ain't good. It might be real cold outside. That ain't good. Um, so if you'd use key clamps now, this wouldn't happen. Did you hear me? Y'all get your key clamps now. Uh, but the pad's already out. So you find it there on the floor. You pick it up and look at it. Because nine times out of ten, that pad is not going to sit exactly centered in that key cup. And you, you can tell by the, the, the ring that's, that's in the pad and uh, all that. So, so get it back to where it was and then hold that key down or uh, wedge it down if you got some of those little wooden wedges that's something else to get at your technician's uh, shop get, get about a half dozen of those little wedges so you'll know and then take a hair dryer take a uh, cigarette lighter even uh, some source of heat and warm it up warm it up and let that uh, adhesive reheat, get soft again, and grip. Now, let me tell you something. If that pad was properly installed, all the technician did when they installed it was they painted a very thin layer of uh, adhesive, uh, I mean with a paintbrush now, all around the edges and all around the back, sealed the back entirely, and then painted the entire interior of the cup. Uh, if you've got big old dollops of uh, uh, shellac, a hot glue, God, hot glue, whatever, uh, in, in a cup, then note to self, my technician don't know what the hell he's doing. Because if you've got just a big wad of, of, of adhesive in there, you put the pad back in, wait a minute, it's going to do that. If it's flat because it's just painted, it's not going to move. You know, come on. John Lyons, that's one of our great local players, too, and he's a real nice fellow. John, set an example. Now, like this uh, presentation and uh, share it with your friends. And my brother Dave, he's a world-famous rocket scientist. <laughs> he's good-looking like all the Goodson men, too. Uh, but anyway, uh, so be sure that you get that pad back where it went and be sure you get that key cup good and hot so that adhesive has a chance to uh, re-bind uh, to the uh, uh, key cup. Hey, Ron, Ron Messina, glad to have you with us. So um, sooner or later, that's going to happen to you and uh, you might as well be prepared. This is human here that all my notes are sticking together. Believe it or not, see, I have uh, notes for all these presentations. Okay, so I got to tell you a good story on myself. Um, I was playing, when I first moved to New Orleans, Charles Neville introduced me to uh, some guys that had a band that I admired greatly. And they had me go with them up to Baton Rouge and play a, a, a gig in this fancy nightclub. 
And boy, I'd always wanted to play with these guys as long as I'd been in New Orleans, heard these guys, man, I, I knew I was in some tall cotton. And I get up there, first set for my moment of glory, <laughs> probably my first solo, and I'm bearing down hard on that Mark, Mark Six. And sure enough, the octave mechanism just falls off the horn. And they were laughing their butts off at the world famous repairman, and his horn is falling apart right before our very eyes. That's the truth. And what happened was the screws had uh, on that octave, or, or just one of the screws, had backed out. Now, understand this uh, that's not in any way uncommon. And back when I was, you know, young and stupid and playing six nights a week, uh, I would go over my horn once a week with my screwdriver and I would make sure every screw on that horn was in there, you know, like the German virgin, you know about that, good and tight. So uh, anyway, hey, that's Keith and my buddy. Yes, sir. Keith Esposito, he's a very good customer of mine and he's funny too, he's a good guy. Uh, but anyway, so those screws are going to back out, okay? Just assume that. So let's talk about what we can do to avoid that. Well, the thing that I do is when I'm putting my horn back together after I've done a repad or any of that, uh, I always put on the threaded portion only of the screw, I put just a tiny little bit of Loctite. Now, Loctite, and you get this at any hardware store, what it is, it's a thread locking compound, and it comes in several different colors. And uh, the uh, blue Loctite, I think, is forever. <laughs> yeah, literally. And the red Loctite is, well, you know, it just tightens it up. It can, it can get it uh, loose, you know, but it, it's going to hold its stuff. Uh, it, if you don't want to make a trip to the hardware store and get some Loctite, then uh, talk to your girlfriend and and get some uh, fingernail polish. Just put a little bit of, of that around the threads of the screw before you put it in there because you can get that loose very easily. All right, another thing that you can do, and, and we used to do this on the um, adjusting screws for the G-sharp and the B-flat, those, those little, little bastards, which are always so hard to get right. Um, is we would take some of that white Teflon tape. Remember I told you to keep a roll of that in your case at all times. That's right. Keep a roll in there. Take a little bit of that, wrap it around that screw, and, you know, just enough to where uh, it will, uh, you know, just take up a little play. That's where that screw don't move. Uh, that's a good thing to do. Uh, but it's very important, you know, be proactive. Take your screwdriver. And by the way, kids, get you some good screwdrivers. Look at this. Boy, I got these in all sizes, all different size tips. Uh, I, got, I got one screwdriver. That that thing, really, no kidding, it's got to be the, the shaft on it, two feet long, but the head is about like this. And you talk about something that'll torque the lower stack screw out of a bass saxophone in a hurry. Oh, Brother Dave. See, now, my brother Dave is a graduate engineer, and he says clear fingernail polish. Well, of course it's clear, David. Uh, of course, you've seen some of them girls I go out with that have purple metal flake, <laughs> you know, whatever. But, yeah, uh, I get you some clear fingernail polish to, tie, uh, to paint those threads with. Uh, Casey Ray Light, do I want him in this video? You better believe I do. Now, Casey Ray's one of my best friends and best customers, and he's, he's a serious player, too, and he's a real deal. Don't let anybody kid you. Casey Ray Light can play. He's a good guy, too. He walked through my door. That's one of my favorite guys to ever see, Casey Ray Light. Y'all get out and see him play whenever you can. He plays all over the southeast. All right, now, so keep those screws tight. Make sure they don't back out. That's very important. All right. Now, another thing, and I just 
did this for a customer of mine um, that uh, this actually one of my students uh, who's uh, a student he, he was here during the summer but the rest of the year he's on full scholarship at the Berkeley College of Music up in Boston he, he's a great player but man his horn had all kind of flutter particularly in the lower stack blah, 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 blah. all right and, and what generally calls it causes that assuming it's been set up properly in the first place is that the impact of, of, of those silencers on the feet of the keys uh, has compressed them and, and and the guy who put the horn together used uh, ordinary cork and it really got compressed and hard and um, sure makes a lot of noise and, and, and just flutters back and forth so here's what you do about that First, get you some uh, good quality felt like this here. Now this this is really high quality woven stuff. And once again, I, I get that from a, a guy who covers pool tables. Uh, not that I'd ever hang out in the pool hall now. I don't want anybody thinking that about me. Uh, but uh, the, the felt you cover a, a good quality pool table with is the best you can get. Um, and you know, cut that fit. And here's here's the secret. Here's the secret. Put a piece of that felt on the foot of the key, and then put a piece of it. A uh, little. We usually cut a little circle because um, we got you know punches and all that. But whatever, whatever shape you like, put it where that key foot is going to impact felt to felt. Yeah. And you say, well, Steve, that's too thick, and it closes down my my. Well, sure it does. So that's where you take that strip of um, of emery paper like I showed you a minute ago, and you use that because you, you can sand good quality felt just like you do a uh, good quality cork. If you are just hell-bent on using cork, and that's okay, that's okay. Look, for at least that application, then do this. See this where it's got all those little black spots in it? Yeah, you know what that is? That's rubber. That's genuine rubber. And rubber kind of absorbs on impact. Uh, that, that stuff is called Tech Cork, and I know you can get it from my good friends up at musicmedic.com. It's great stuff. Sands beautifully. And uh, hello, Gerald. It, it, it absorbs uh, the impact on that. But you want to keep that mechanism from fluttering. The lower stack is strictly prone to that. So remember, felt to felt, felt to felt. And that, that'll solve your problem. Now, I'll tell you something that's even better than that. Uh, and that's uh, to use sorbethane instead of felt or core. Uh, sorbethane is an impact absorbing material. Uh, it's what they put in the soles of running shoes, you know, to absorb the impact and all that. You put some sorbethane in there, and that, that key will not flutter. End of discussion. All right, so we got the noise out of the key flutter. Gerald, I hope your help's better too, buddy. Been thinking about you. Um, now, here's another thing that you're in a recording studio and suddenly the engineer is coming out from behind the board and walking into your booth and saying, uh, what can we do to quiet this horn down? Because you've got all kind of clicks and rattles and key noise and, and, you know, the microphone's picking it up and we can't have that. Of course, same thing going to happen on a um, live gig, but it, it's, it's even more irritating in a recording studio. All right. First thing to do, assuming that your horn is in good repair and there's no excess play between the keys, if it is, taking somebody that knows how to do it, and get them to swedge the keys. Uh, we extrude the, the ends of the keys, make them just a tiny little bit long, make them fit uh, good and tight. Uh, and after they're swedged properly, and, and that's a job for an expert now. Don't You ain't got the tools, and you don't know how to do it yourself. Uh, then the next thing you want to do, I do this before you go to the recording studio, is you give that horn a good oiling. 
a good oiling. Now, what's a good oiling? That means you put one drop of a high detergent key oil, nothing else. It's got to be high detergent between every gap in the keyword. And put one drop on every one of those needle springs and let it run down the entire spring. Um, now, here is uh, John Birdsong. You better believe it. John is the uh, director of the Paradise Tumblers, which I used to play with many years ago. Um, but uh, at any rate, you want, you want to get everything oiled up, you'd be amazed at how much quieter that will make your horn uh, feel, uh, make your horn sound. And also, um, you know, it, it, it'll not only do that, but your horn's going to feel a lot better. But don't use any kind of key oil that is not high detergent. Why? Because you want it to clean itself every time you oil the keys. Uh, you put a, a drop in, you play horn for six hours, you know, working on all your scales, long tones, all that good stuff. But you might see some black gunk kind of working out between the keys. Just dab it off with a Q-tip or a paper towel, something like that, because that is um, where the volatile component has evaporated from the old oil, and that stuff's gummy and sticky, and it'll slow the action down. High detergent key oil will uh, clean that. And who makes one? Well, uh, we do. We you, we have uh, Steve's Bourbon Street Key Oil. It is the most high detergent key oil on the market. And I'll tell you something else about Steve's Bourbon Street Key Oil. Uh, many people have been using it for years. Uh, not only does it do a good job of lubricating the horn, but also it makes your horn smell like hippie girls. And um, when you've been doing this as long as I have, you'll realize that hippie girls are well-known friends of all saxophones. And uh, the, the regular use of uh, Steve's Bourbon Street Key Oil uh, not only make your horn smell like hippie girls, uh, people tell me that it actually attracts hippie girls. So I, I don't know, but we sell a lot of it. And we make it right here in the oil. It's right here. By the way, let's get some more likes and shares on this thing. All right, now here's one other thing. And uh, I, 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 I learned this from that uh, great classical tenor saxophonist, James Hewlett. Oh, what a monster player he is. I got to spend a whole afternoon with him one time. Um, at a symphony concert he was going to be giving that evening. And he showed me something. I, nobody ever showed me before, but I do it all the time now. Where your needle spring catches that little nipple on the rod, you put a dab of thick grease in there at every one of those. And keep, keep that well greased. You ought to be able to see that little dab of grease. Now, uh, Professor Hill used to use, he said it had to be blue axle grease. Okay, whatever. i tell you what we use. Uh, I use, uh, I, I buy it at Walmart. It's a lithium-based Teflon-bearing trailer ball lubricant. And, and we just put it on there with, uh, you know, the end of a needle file, toothpick, whatever's handy. But you keep that at that contact point. And, man, it will cut out all kind of clicks and rattles on your horn. Oh, one other thing I forgot to remind you of, when you're checking those screws back out, be sure and check all of the uh, screws on all the key guards and, you know, other stuff, the cages around the B-flat, B, C, E-flat, uh, clothing guard on the back, all that stuff. Um, that's very important. All right, now here's another one that here's a little diagnostic test you can do yourself and probably solve the problem yourself. Take your neck, put it in the receiver with a, and, and run the screw down to where it's just barely holding it in place and rotate the neck around 360 degrees using a very, 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 light 
hand pressure. Because what you want to do is you want to feel and see if the resistance is more or less at any point in that rotation. Huh. Well, it is. What does that mean? That means that either your neck or your receiver or both are not round or certainly not, uh, you, you know, matching up perfectly with each other. So here's something you can do. Uh, take a little bit of uh, that high detergent tea oil, just a little bit now, a couple of drops, and take just the tiniest little bit of toothpaste. And uh, I use, I prefer, now, full disclosure, my shop, I have fancy lamping powder that I pay a lot of money for. I don't know why, because uh, Colgate toothpaste, the white variety, works equally well. But you can take it, and, and, and distribute it easily, evenly around here. Put it back. Hey, Giles. Now, listen, this guy is a great entertainment attorney, and he's not so highfalutin with all that high end uh, entertainment law practice he got that he doesn't pay, play a couple of gigs every weekend. And I'm proud of you, buddy. I'm proud. He's a great guy, too. But he really knows entertainment law. Giles Davis. Uh, we all proud to know it. But anyway. Take that neck with, with that stuff on there and, and rotate it around, see? And what it'll do is it will lap your neck and your receiver into perfection. Sure will. Okay. Uh, then take it out, take a paper towel, or whatever, and wipe it off. Really, it's got to be clean. Got to be clean and look at it. And you may see some bright, shiny spots on that receiver or on the tenor of the neck. And those were high spots. And uh, now your neck ought to fit a lot better. Now, if after doing that, your neck is too loose and moves around, you have got to take it to a qualified repair technician. And here's a word to the wise about that. There's two different types of expanders that we use on saxophone necks. One of them is what we call a pedal expander, and it looks just like the petals of a flower. It goes out like that. You turn a little knob at the back, and then it expands, and you twist it, and it just ter terribly screws up the interior of the tenon. <laughs> or you can get something that looks like an old-fashioned can opener. And boy, does that do a good job. It sure does. I've, used, I've been using the same one since 1972. It was one of the first tools I ever bought. But anyway, uh, make sure your technician uses that can opener too. Ask to see it. And then after they've uh, expanded it, then your technician has got a thing where you got some collets that are the correct size. And he's got a box full of these big metal collets. And you put a neck in there and you rotate it in there and that burnishes that neck, uh, which has now been expanded to the size you want into absolutely perfect roundness. And that's ever so important. Uh, and that way it won't be leak, uh, leaking at the neck. And that's so important, so important. Um, you'd be amazed at how much difference it'll make to get your neck, um, you know, squared away with regard to the uh, uh, receiver. Okay. All right, now we're going to talk about the number one complaint. The number one complaint, let me get my prompt here. Guy comes into the shop and says, Steve, my pad's thick. I had this guy repad my horn, and he put on these really shiny pads, man. They, they waterproof, Steve. Yeah. Some bitch put uh, pads on there with silicone on them. And silicone is mildly adhesive. And even if everything is right with your horn, that silicone is mildly adhesive enough when it sits down on the tone hole, it's going to be a little resistant picking up. Okay? It really is. And uh, what can you do about that? Get it repadded. Uh, use kangaroo leather pads. Uh, they don't require any treatment. Now, we put, uh, at our shop, we put a little Mojo's Never Stick uh, pad powder on them, which we work into the pores of the leather, uh, but uh, kangaroo leather uh, is the strongest 
and softest leather on the planet, and it doesn't stick. Oh, all right. Now here's here's what happens. You got a pad, and for the purposes of discussion, we're gonna look at this pad and see uh, the resonator shiny, but the pad not shiny. Why? Because it ain't got no damn silicone in it. Uh, now, guy said, "Well, Steve, I use those pads you say to use, but it's still sticking." Well, of course it is, you knucklehead. Why am I pad sticking? Let's think a little bit about how a saxophone is made. The way a saxophone is made is, is they draw the tone holes from the body, then they level them, and then they may either roll the tops. Not many people do that. They may put a little ring on the tops, or it may just be, you know, where they drew it, and then they flatten it out with a, a machine. All right. And then they lacquer the body. The, you lacquer the bodies before you put the keys on. So no matter what the ultimate finish on the top of the tone holes is, it's got lacquer on it. And then you buy the horn, you start playing it, and after a few hours, guess what? You have worn the lacquer off the top of that tone hole from where that pad sits down. Huh. And uh, there's moisture there coming out of your mouth. And uh, what happens? Well, it forms that green stuff that we've all seen, which is known in social circles as patina. And that patina is mildly adhesive. And that patina is the number one cause of pet sticking. Did you hear me? It's the patina. It's not the fact that you were uh, drinking good bourbon there at sound check and you blew some of that through there and that got a little sticky or, or whatever. No, it's the patina almost always. So what do you do about it? Well, you take some of that ultra, ultra fine paper um, that we talked about. Here's some right here that we use in our shop. See the back of that? 2,500. And... You tear a little strip. Once again, now this is a no-brainer, boys and girls. You tear that strip to where he's about the size. I, I, I use, uh, of course, I've been doing this since right after the earth cooled, but uh, I, I use my index finger as a judge for what size that, uh, that strip ought to be. See? Yeah, look at that. It matches up. And then I'm going to take the pad. And the paper side is going to be toward the pad. The abrasive side is going to be toward the top of the tone hole. Now, this is 2,500 grit paper. And I'm going to tell you right now, it is less abrasive than the toothpaste I use when I brush my teeth. So, no, it's not going to hurt your teeth. And it ain't going to hurt the metal on your horn. But what it's going to do is it's going to clean that patina off. So, you take this, you put it between the pad, top of the tone hole, and you pull him out. And you make sure that you go all the way around. Go all the way around. If you'll do that once a week, your pads ain't never going to stick. They're not. Something that will also help in that regard is to block the uh, pads off when you're through. And I know it's four in the morning, and you're tired, and there's that cute little waitress you met, and well, you know how that works. Uh, but anyway, uh, blot your pads off. With a, just take a cocktail napkin or whatever. Just blot the excess moisture off. Moisture, that saliva that's on there, saliva is digestive juice. It'll digest your pads literally over time. And, uh, yeah, no, it's not the fruity rum drinks, kid. You ought to drink good bourbon anyway. You know better now. Uh, but in, anyway, uh, blot the pads. Um, and then put your key clamps on, go to the next gig, and once a week, just clean them off like that. It doesn't take but a minute to do the whole horn, and you just won't have sticking pads. You won't, I promise you. But you got to do those things faithfully. All right, so all of those are things that you can do yourself. Now, there's a lot of things you can't do yourself, 
because you ain't got specialty tools and you ain't got the skills to do it, okay? So don't. Take it to a, a very experienced technician. And, and before we go today, I, I, I got to raise uh, one little thing. Uh, probably all you good folks are here with us tonight and are, are liking this presentation and sharing it uh, to all your friends and family because you saw, uh, you know, this thing that we send around to our mailing list. Be sure and sign up for our mailing list. If you're not on it, you can go to nationofmusic.com down at the bottom of the page, sign up for the mailing list. And look at the bargains and Sharon's attitude. We've got a lot of clearance merchandise. But anyway, uh, we, we got this uh, gal we've been using for a long time. She got a pointer, point to a black boy, and we got whatever announcement we want to make. <laughs> I got to tell you, one of these uh, social justice warriors, uh, this gal, <laughs> uh, told me that, well, you know, you're, you're offended by 50% of your potential market. Really? 50%, huh? You're sure about that? And uh, so the simple fact of the matter is this. Number one, it ain't none of that woman's damn business what kind of graphics I use in my promotional materials. None of her business. Number two, uh, I happen to like women. You can ask anybody that knows me. They say, oh, yeah. Steve likes them girls. Uh, and, and this woman who was dogging me, she just trolling me, of course, in, uh, in one of the dis repair discussion groups, saying, well, you know, maybe back in the 70s, uh, you know, tits and nipples and big butts and mini skirts were okay. But they're not okay in 2018. Let me tell you something. They are with the girls I know and the girls I hang out with and with my wife, um, and uh, I don't know where she got it, that that ever went out of style, because damn sure it didn't around here. Uh, maybe she just not capable of uh, the try. I don't know. I, I, I don't know this gal. But anyway, uh, I, I just wanted to set the record straight that uh, <laughs> we ain't gonna let her tell us what to do, because it ain't none of a damn business. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue on uh, using Miss Mojo Vixen um, to deliver the message to all our good fans about these seminars and other announcements we have to make. So that's it. Uh, if you have questions, if you have comments, suggestions, or topic you'd like to see us cover in one of these uh, seminars, uh, just send me an email, uh, or uh, you can... Uh, Hey, how's my buddy up in Canada, Bernard Jean? Um, but, you know, send me an email, call me during business hours, whatever, uh, and, and let us know, and we'll try to answer your questions and all that and share it with the rest of the saxophone community. Um, that's it. Uh, how do I get those waitresses to leave with me? I tell you, Giles, now you're a smart guy, and I've hung out with you a lot. The way I did it is I'd always tell them we had candy and puppies on the tour bus. And them young girls, they always like to want to see those candy and puppies. And I'd take them on the bus. Works every time. Every time, Giles. Uh, you all try. So anyway, uh, that's it for tonight. I thank, thank you all for attending, for all your questions during the seminar. It's, it's, it's good to see so many of my good Longtime customers and friends uh, here. We'll have this up on uh, YouTube in a day or so. So uh, I thank you very much. I want everybody to remember a couple of things. Practice long tones every day. Always remember, keep your reed wet, and always play sax gourmet. Why? Because sax gourmet plays best. All right. We'll see you in two weeks back here on Facebook Live. Goodbye for now.